Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and we are in the middle of an interlude between seasons of this podcast. So we are taking some listener questions today. Actually, this is one listener question. We looked at this question and said, we could definitely use a whole episode on this. So here is the question from our dear listener. In the episode titled A Bond in Blood, you talk about how some people boil down faith to an act or a work, the only, quote, work you need to do to be saved. As we know, and as you point out, faith is not a work. But is faith ever an action? Is it an active thing? Can we say that we actively have faith, or is it a passive thing that is existent, whether or not we feel it or think about it one day and don't the next? Are there things that we can choose by the Holy Spirit's work within us to do to strengthen that faith? Or is that something that only the Holy Spirit can do regardless of how we live our lives? So that is the question for today. (laughs) (laughs) That is the multiple questions. Yes. Uh, All of them good and all of them extremely Mm -hmm. relevant in this day. Um, Well, every day, really. (laughs) Every day. But these are things that are, this is a particular place where the gospel has been under attack a lot in the last decade or two. Mm -hmm. So we want to move carefully. But but you're right, of course, Brian, we go back to the Reformation. This this was the issue. You can go back to the Synod of Dort. In many ways, this was the issue. Keeps coming back in different dress. And even though we are convinced we have the answers, we we ourselves are going to have to be really careful. It's how we phrase things because it's easy to say it not quite right through carelessness or because you're trying to emphasize one side or the other and open loopholes that trucks or 747s can go through. (laughs) It's a good time to listen to Jordan Peterson's advice. (laughs) Be precise with your speech. Be precise with your speech. Tell the truth or at least don't lie. (laughs) That's a start. (laughs) We we listen to the same album. (laughs) Akira the Dawn. He's got clout. It's actually, it's really, that's my uh, preemptive reco. Is. <laughs> <laughs> we will link that album in the show notes. <laughs> okay. Oh. I was, I literally was listening to that today while I worked. It's such, it's so good. That's my like cleaning my house music. <laughs> uh, the I the no one that I love. you're talking about. Oh, Greg. So it's, it's this, you know, Jordan Peterson's got all this audio available to listen to. And uh, this electronic musician put a bunch of songs together like encapsulating these ideas and it's just like a really groovy beat with jordan peterson talking over the top of it and it's great (laughs) i still love his um the way he talks about you know what what it means to lie and it's like Mm -hmm. lying is being inconsistent with the very nature of being itself Mm -hmm. it's like you're being you're you're going against reality yeah. You're warping the nature of being. And it's like, yeah. you you shouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to try not to do that today. We are going to be as precise as we know how to be, because this is a very important topic. And as a side so issue. So to start, the Trinity is like an egg. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick. Uh... Um, which brings us where I exactly was going to go, the necessity of creeds and confessions with a very precise mm-hmm. language, also very public language. If we say Westminster Shorter Catechism or Heidelberg Catechism, uh, anyone within the Reformed community should know what we're talking about. A lot of people will have particular questions and answers memorized. And we, we are used to particular expressions that within the document are fleshed out. So although you can pervert them, it takes some energy and some creativity after all these years. Yeah. And if you don't know these things, we'll link them in the show notes so oh, you can read yes, them. yes, <laughs> we will. Uh, but, but when you adopt a philosophy of all I need is the Bible, yes, but no. Is, is the Bible sufficient? It's sufficient for what God intended it to be sufficient for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but God also created the church as a community that works together, worships together, grows together. And although we receive, well, first of all, God appointed within the church past apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. He also appointed that having received the word from such gifted people, in often in the context of public worship, but in other contexts as well, we are then like the parts of a body to pass it around 
and, and, and build up the body mm -hmm. so that not all of us need to, say, learn Hebrew or Greek or be experts on a Mideastern archaeology or all the other things that will come into play at some point in understanding Scripture clearly. Scripture is clear enough to show us our sin and clear enough to point us to Christ and to how we lay hold on him. But the devil's very clever, and so are his followers, and they like to confuse things because sometimes they know the Bible pretty well too. Mm -hmm. And they conveniently drop out things, pervert things, or make things sound very plausible. And unless we mm -hmm. have an anchor outside of ourselves that can also look at the Bible and say, yes, you're reading the Bible correctly, that is what it says to everybody else. It's what it's been saying to everyone else for 2,000 years. There's a chance that we fall into that. Yes, I am just believing what the Bible says. Jesus is not Jehovah. <laughs> well, it's like there. there's two things I, I always point to is that one, this kind of solo scriptura mm -hmm. idea where it's, it's mm -hmm. me and my Bible because I have the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's going to let me be the one to interpret it properly completely glosses over the fact that the past 2,000 years of faithful preachers and teachers have also had the Holy Spirit helping <laughs> right. them do that. And secondly, it's just very arrogant to <laughs> presume that you, in a completely different cultural context, more than 2,000 years separated from when these things were written, would somehow know it better than the people who studied it 500 years closer to it than you are, 1,000 years, 1,500 years closer to it than you are. And oftentimes are writing it in their maturity. Like mm -hmm. I, as a 27-year-old, simply do not have the same wisdom to interpret the Bible as someone who is older, just by virtue of not having lived as long. Mm -hmm. Getting a head start helps a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's a good deal of it, getting a head start. Helps a lot. No one comes to calculus or physics or the medical sciences and says, I will start from scratch and I will play mm -hmm. catch up real fast because I'm so smart so that by the time all of you are getting out of medical school, I'll be ready to open my own practice. Well, I say nobody says that. Nobody intelligent <laughs> says that. Nobody who isn't a quack says that because mm. we, we rely on what's been done before. And this is how God ordained that human society, human community should work. Mm -hmm. And to, to turn that aside and ignore it is to slap God in the face. I don't need your help, God. I don't need the helps you gave me. I can figure this out. After all, your word is, is clear and infallible. Well, it is clear and infallible, as I said earlier, for the things that God intends it to be clear about for the people it intends it to be clear to. First of all, it's not clear to unbelievers. Mm -hmm. And that's not the Bible's fault. <laughs> right. God, God didn't stutter. But unbelief will, will twist it at every point. And there are things in Scripture, as the Confessions say, that are not alike clear in themselves. And the you read the Bible, the Bible says this. Things that the, <laughs> Those the things that Paul says, they're hard yeah. to understand. <laughs> yeah, and that's an inspired apostle saying that about yeah. Paul. <laughs> The Bible is there, and we're to read it, and we're to wrestle with it, and we're to try to understand it. But nowhere does, does God ever suggest that we're all on our own. If we have mm -hmm. to be, we're on a desert island, and all we got is a Bible, then we do what we can. And if we're on a Caribbean island, and the only people around are Roman Catholics, then maybe we still do the best with what we can and look for a shortwave radio. We but, should still talk to the Roman Catholics. And we should still talk to Roman Catholics <laughs> carefully, yes. checking everything they have against what the Bible says, because there's some things they're right about, and there's a whole lot of things they're wrong about, which kind of brings us by roundabout ways to this. Mm -hmm. There are people, at least within the last generation or so, many people who I read at one time with, with Prophet, who spent a lot of time reading Roman Catholics or read it, people from earlier generations who had interacted with Rome a good deal. And they have come away saying, you know, the evangelical church and the Reformed church, they've, they've, they've gotten this justification by faith thing right. They've misunderstood what this faith thing is. Uh, and, it's, and it's opened the door for all kinds of antinomianism in the church. And this, uh, the idea of uh, rejecting the lordship of Jesus, you could be saved without, without embracing Jesus as Lord. Uh, we want to get away from that. We want people to understand that faith is a commitment. It is faithfulness to the covenant. It is obedience. 
<laughs> Lots so, of red lights going on. Right <laughs> red lights should be coming on. If we're familiar with the conditions and creeds, we should say, wait, we've heard this before. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it, it, it is very much what Rome taught in the days of the Reformation. We've, we've sometimes done the church, the Protestant church of its service by saying, well, Rome teaches justification by works. There is some truth in that, but that's not how they would say it. In fact, they would deny that. And we right. need to be polite and, again, not lie, mm-hmm. not bear false witness, even against people we don't agree with and don't trust. What they say is that uh, the grace of God in Christ is wrapped up in the church and its sacraments. And as we, by our free will, come to the sacraments, the Holy Spirit works grace in us and transforms us, works charity in our heart. So that we learn to love God, love our neighbor, and thus begin to obey uh, that basic principle of love and respond to it. So that God at some point will see what we've done, recognize his own grace in us, and pronounce us his friends, justify us. So they say, are, are you saved by grace? Are you saved by works? Oh, absolutely not. We're saved by Christ, by his shed blood. We're saved by the grace of God, by the work of the Holy Spirit. And they mean it. They're not lying mm-hmm. yeah. from their perspective. But they're not using those words the way we mean them. And we have to flesh them out and understand what they're saying. They are saying that justification comes after a certain undefined amount of obedience, something that only God knows and recognizes and can judge, uh, even though the Holy Spirit is already at work in us. And although we are church members, we cannot be sure of God's friendship of final justification until, well, that's the point. We can't until we see purgatory or the face of God, because at any last minute, you could commit a mortal sin and throw it all away. So you you have to continue in the faith. And to the Protestant here, that sounds an awful lot like justification by works. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the line in the Westminster larger catechism, I don't have the whole answer memorized, but justification by faith in the in the answer to the question what is justification it talks about how justification is not for the sake of good works even the ones wrought in us mm-hmm. it's the ones that Christ did on our behalf and this just comes back to once again properly distinguishing law and gospel which is something Luther just hammers home. That's his That's his thing. That's the thing he gets <laughs> and will not let you forget. Yeah. It, you, you have to, to understand that there are, you know, there's, there's the, the principle of law and the principle of faith, which is what the gospel is centered on. And I'm reminded as well of um, Christianity and Liberalism by J. Gresham Machen, where he, he says, the gospel is at base a story about something done for you. It does not involve you doing anything. Right. It's not our story. Exactly. It's except insofar as we benefit from the results of it. Yeah. It's not it's it's good news, not a cooking recipe or a prescription for service or someone, a plan of attack. Someone on on I think Twitter or maybe it was a Facebook thread somewhere, but it was it was a friend of mine who's who's very very solid theologically and he was saying that you know the, the difference between law and gospel is the difference between saying i heard i watched the news today and then as a result it you know i i did something else and that that's what sanctification is it's the difference between that and i watched the news today so i was on the news <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, that's very apt. Um, so so I'll ask at this point, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son on the altar? Oh, we're going to go there already. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to save it for later? We can no, come back you to brought, it. You, you brought it up, so we might as well okay. begin to deal with it. Because again, we're defining terms. Mm-hmm. And within this last generation, there have been a group of people that have had various names placed upon them, and the names are not nearly as important as their shenanigans. <laughs> yeah. um, they've, they've come to the Bible, and they've recognized something that is somewhat true, that the Bible does not always use what we think of as theological terms in exactly the same way. Mm-hmm. 
and, and, and sometimes it doesn't use it the same way that theologians have settled on. For instance, during the Reformation, the word regeneration did not mean exactly what we can, how we construe it today. Mm -hmm. We know that it's a matter of historical change and clarification, and we, 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 we catch that. But if you don't know that, you reading Calvin, you might, wait, what's he saying? Or even um, in Paul, when he talks about sanctification, not in the sense of becoming more like Jesus through your life, but in the sense of being made holy being made once holy. and for all. Right. You know, yeah. what some call positional sanctification or definitive sanctification. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's true. And any good theologian, no, any good, good student of scripture knows that. I mean, there's simple, something as simple as the word God. It means all kinds of things in scripture because the Bible is, a, aside from being divinely inspired, is also written by real human beings whom God uses. Who in have different contexts. Yeah, and uses, that people use words in different contexts, and that's the way humanity works. So we do have to read in context and figure out what's going on here. There's the word love, for instance, mm -hmm. or the, oh, the one there's this passage in Hosea about go love a friend, go go love a woman beloved of her friend according to the love that God has for Israel. And you just look at all these words, love, 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 and almost every time it means something else. <laughs> in one case, it, mean, it means adulterous lust. In another, it's God's divine yeah. saving love. And in another, it's the prophet's imperfect love for the woman who's cheated on him. In Kings, where our, our teachers are teaching right now, there's another passage where the inspired writer speaks of the Samaritans. So they feared the Lord and they served other gods. They feared the Lord and they walked after their idols. To this day, they do that, the same thing. They don't fear the Lord. You know, I was like, wait, you just said they did twice. Yeah, he's using yeah. the language a little bit differently. In context, Catches in that case what's bitter irony, but it is also true that some people, if you ask these people, do you fear God? Oh, yeah, we fear God. But that's not the way the Bible normally uses that. So in this mm -hmm. word justification in context is what's being talked about. It's not a theological term. It always means the same thing. It's a human word that we, it has a range of meanings and, and context will help us understand what's going on. Now, first of all, we believe that Scripture is inspired by God, and God is smart enough not to contradict, contradict himself. Mm -hmm. Your uh, what, what, the natural law guy you keep quoting, whose name I can never remember. Oh, Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson. <laughs> well, what was his definition of lying, Brian? That he. Oh, you're you're warping the the structure of being. Yeah, no. you're standing in defiance of reality. No. Yeah. As far as Scripture is concerned, God Himself is reality. God is truth. Which, by the way, as you read through the, the Westminster Confession, I found this out back in, in college when I was doing a Bible study. And I wanted to say, well, what does the Bible say is truth? And I looked all over the place and got every reference I could because I was amazed at how little any of the standard works said. And then finally, I, some, at some point, someplace, I stumbled across the reference in, in the Westminster Standards uh, where it references truth. And parenthetically, it says, God, who is truth himself. Well, yeah. As a parenthesis. <laughs> That's not, yeah, a parenthesis. But they so assumed it. It was so yeah. basic to their thinking. They they couldn't pass without mentioning it, but they, they almost didn't think you had to because we're talking about Christianity. How could it be anything else? So God, God always speaks truth, and his truth is coherent, and there are no contradictions. And the Bible, the whole Bible, is the Word of God. And although Luther may have wonders about what in the world James was doing in the New Testament, it is there. <laughs> and so we come and we say, all right, whatever's going on here, there's no contradiction. Mm -hmm. James is the shorter book. Luke is talking about a particular topic that we can catch and we, we jump into the flow of the passage. And we, we can see that he's talking about how faith evidences itself. Mm -hmm. And so, and then we can go back to Paul and track his argument through numerous epistles where he keeps on coming back to this. Someone at one point, some person who I think I, his name I remember, so I will not call him an idiot, but um, <laughs> said said something along the lines of, "Well, if you pulled Romans out of the out of the canon, how would where would you actually find justification by?" <laughs> Where would you not? Why is that? Anyway. Like, Hebrews 11. The amount <laughs> yeah. of quoting of other places that exists in Romans. In Romans, yeah. yeah. You know, Rom Romans is referencing, well, Romans is in many ways, it's a commentary on Genesis. Yeah. Let's follow the marginal notes and see how many times 
Paul is appealing back to Genesis, first of all. And, and you mentioned Hebrews 11. The whole thing here is talking about the righteousness which is by faith. And I, that we want to look at Hebrews 11 before we're done. Well, clearly but that any, just means that's how you get started. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. So uh, let me, I'm, I'm, I'm near unto James since my Bible's open to Hebrews. So I'll turn over a couple pages. And in case anyone does not know what the world we're talking about, it goes like this. Uh, what does a prophet, my brethren, though a man say he have faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother be a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and, and filled, and none that was standing you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. The other man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Well, thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. All right, at this point, the argument seems pretty clear. It's that there is something that people call faith that sits and does nothing. Uh, and it's the kind of faith that the demons have. <laughs> they believe, intellectually give assent to the fact that God is. And there are many people who will say, yes, Jesus is God. Jesus died for my sins. Jesus saved sinners. But that's where it ended. I, I remember having to ask this of a young man once uh, who was really failing in what seemed to be a long-held faith, but he, he, he was throwing it all away. And I, I asked him, do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? And his response, very careful, very deliberate, was, I believe that Jesus died for sinners. So it's not what I asked. Mm. Yeah. I know. <laughs> you see, that was the point. He was struggling with that. Was he willing to embrace Christ as his Savior, or was he simply going to acknowledge that the theology of our church happened to be accurate? Mm -hmm. The demons know who Jesus is. They, they testify to Jesus over and over again uh, with fear, screaming sometimes. <laughs> Paul Washer mm -hmm. says, the demons believe, and they're more pious than you because they're trembling. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> that would, yes, that. And he goes on to, sh to show that that kind of bare intellectual assent is not true faith, and it doesn't issue in any kind of works, because true faith, James is saying, does exactly that. It leads us to do things like kindness and love, practical love, to our neighbor. There's a, a Peanuts cartoon where Snoopy's out in the cold, shivering in the rain, and Linus and Charlie Brown, who are all nicely wrapped up with hot hats and scarves and such, say, oh, there is there is a Snoopy. We must go comfort him. Yes, let us go comfort him. <laughs> so they walk over to him and and say to him, I don't remember they made a pat on the head, but they say, Snoopy, be of good cheer. Yes, Snoopy, be of good cheer. And they walk off. <laughs> and the last panel is Snoopy sitting there shivering. Feeling like Job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go away, people. That was, that was annoying. Uh, and that, that's almost exactly it, it here. If you your brother or sister lacks clothing or things necessary for the body and you don't give it to them, but you say the right things, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. <laughs> that what, what good does it do? What good does it do them, but also what good does such a faith do you? That's not being like your heavenly father. That's not trusting God for salvation. That's empty, meaningless talk. And so James comes down to, so look, you want to show your faith off. Show me how you can do that without works, and I will show you my faith by what I do. So we're talking about faith as it appears in the public sphere, in the human sphere, revealing itself for what it is, for really revealing itself to actually be faith at all. And it's in that context that finally he comes and says what, what you were quoting. Was not our Abraham, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works? And by the way, notice that faith and works here are distinct, not the mm -hmm. same thing. Faith wrought, faith worked with his works. And by works was faith made perfect, it came to maturity. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness. He was called the friend of God. But wait, that was something that had already happened. That was back in chapter 15 
um, before God, Abraham looked up at the stars and God said, that's how numerous your seed will be. And Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, even before the covenant cutting ceremony. So mm -hmm. that was already said and pronounced. So the word here, fulfill, this isn't a prophecy to fulfill as we normally think of this. This was a statement, God had a verdict God had already passed that now is being proved, shown, worked out in history by what Abraham does. The faith was already there. The justification was already there. But now it's coming out in public view so everyone can say, wow, this guy's weird. He was going to sacrifice his son because he trusted his God so much. He trusted the promise so much. And so before the eyes of men, Abraham is justified. Uh, his works demonstrate the reality of his faith. This is a traditional interpretation the church has placed upon this, at least with the Protestant church. And it goes on, you see then that by works a man is justified not by faith only, that is not by faith alone. The kind of faith that is alone, that does not produce works, doesn't justify anybody because, again, the demons have that kind of faith. Yeah, Likewise, the reformers would say the faith that justifies is never alone, but it is yeah. faith alone that justifies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did I say that right? Yeah, we are justified you, you by faith clauses. alone. Oh, okay. you know, yeah. We're justified by faith alone, but faith is never alone. Yeah. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the message and so sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So we're answering already one of the questions uh, our listener asked. Uh, is, is there a connection here? Does, does faith do stuff? Yes, mm -hmm. necessarily it does stuff because faith is a heart matter. And, and, and heart means not the superficial emotion that people in the 20th century tend to connect. I love you in my heart. Heart's far deeper than that. Mm -hmm. The heart is the religious focus of our being. It's, it's the ego, the I, the, at the root of, of thinking and feeling and choosing. It's where our values or priorities, our most basic commitments reside, and that's where God places faith. It's the self out of which all of our actions flow. And that it being there, it cannot but produce works, thoughts, mm -hmm. emotions, choices, feelings. Uh, that, that's what it means for us to believe in Jesus with all our heart. That is with every dimension of our heart. Mm -hmm. the, these things are going to come. It can't just sit there and hide in a corner. And, and so the readers or the listeners other question. So can can you go through days without thinking about it? If, if you mean thinking about it in a self-conscious way of how's my faith doing to death today? I will look deep inside myself to try to figure it out. Or even what does scripture say about my faith? I should read something about that today. Yeah, you can go through a lot of days without doing that kind of stuff. But if your faith is real, it is always working and active because it's always shaping your reaction to everything, first of all, to God and then to yourself. Because it's relational. Yeah. It's not yeah. faith is this thing that you possess. No. It's faith in Jesus, faith right. in the God of Scripture. Okay. The faith is, is trust centered on a person. Yes, and that person is not us. <laughs> it's not us. And, and, and that person we can describe with words words that God himself has given us. So we can talk about Jesus being truly God, truly man. We can talk about the virgin birth and his sinless life and his vicarious atonement and his literal resurrection. But again, it's it's not the facts abstracted somehow, but it's the person of whom these facts are, mm -hmm. in, are, are actually true, that, that he is this person, he is this kind of person. He is the only person who is like this, and and that's the person we trust, the person whom we can describe with words, because God has described him with words. So is, is trust trusting a person, or is it trusting the words? Yes. <laughs> it's trusting the person who revealed the words, and the words that reveal the person who revealed them. <laughs> There's no conflict here. You have to get, you have to misunderstand the nature of faith to, to let that in any way be confusing. Uh, we know what it means to trust a person. It mm -hmm. means we know who the person is. They, they've got a name. We have a track record with them. Um, they, they've done things that have proved themselves to be trustworthy. Or oh, there's a relationship that exists. You know, you, in my generation, you saw a cop, you trusted him. Because even if you didn't know him, the badge, the uniform, the police car meant that with very, very, very few exceptions, 
this was going to be a guy who, in if, if I'm in trouble, he's going to help. Mm-hmm. And we, we've blurred that a lot. Sometimes it's been the fault of the police. Often it's been the fault of not the police. But and then our parents, we, we grow up learning to trust our parents. It'd be hard to sit back and say, well, here are all of the individual acts my parents ever did that has earned <laughs> earned my trust. They're my parents. That sums up a lot. Yeah. Even I know them says yeah. so much. Yeah. yeah. I know them. We know God. We know Jesus. We know him from what he has said. And we know that what he has said has played out accurately in our lives. That The, the Bible does indeed conform to reality. And we don't just say that blindly because our presuppositions demanded of us, but it's really the case. Uh, his his grace has been sufficient. Uh, all the things that he says about who we are and, and what he will do for us have proved true over and over and over again. And the more we understand what he has said, the more we get that and the more we trust him. So we talk about faith being a heart matter. The next question has got to be, where does faith come from? Mm-hmm. Because if I generate it out of my own thoughts, feelings, ideas, rationality, choices, then that sounds an awful lot like a work. We've t- I talked earlier about Rome and their perspective on justification. We need for, I think, for a moment to look at classic Arminianism, mm-hmm. um, the, the Arminianism of the Remonstrance that, that was answered by the Senate of Lord. For them, faith became most literally a work. It was a work that God took in place of all the other works. God does not require the whole law of us, but he does require this one thing, trust in Christ, because it's the one thing we can do. And although we have the Holy Spirit's help in doing it, it is still essentially us doing it or the offer of the gospel to everybody would, would not be real. Uh, if it has to, it has to be something that everyone's capable of, and the Holy Spirit will help everybody. But some will embrace that help, and some will reject it. And so, grace is something that can be resisted, can be rejected, or that can be received. And in receiving that grace and receiving the promise, we receive Christ. And so, this one thing, this self-generated with the help of the Spirit, faith, <laughs> does indeed become a good work, because if it's not a sovereign gift of God based upon an eternal plan that has nothing to do with us or our good works done or foreseen or potential, but merely God's good choice and goodwill, then then we have something to bring to God. But if it is God's grace, God's goodwill, God's eternal predestination, God's plan in Christ, then we got nothing. And we don't have to have anything. And that, of course, for those who are saved, that's the wonderful news. (laughs) And But sometimes we look and say, but that's not wonderful news for those who aren't saved. Well, you know what? They don't want to be. Mm-hmm. Their, their their wonderful news is God's going to leave you alone. God's going to abandon you to your sins. Oh, goody! Um, that's not the right response, but it is <laughs> exactly the response of, of every unbeliever. They're glad they don't have to know God, face God, trust Jesus, serve Jesus, or go to heaven. Because heaven's where God is. Now, if they could kick God out of heaven and take his place, that'd be great. Of course, it wouldn't <laughs> be heaven anymore. It'd be something very terrible. Um, they'd love and to they be are God. determined to be happy with not knowing God, even though yeah. it makes them miserable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 we can and we can and should be sad about that. Yeah. But the fact, that, as some have said, the, the incredible thing is not that God hated Esau, but that God loved Jacob. Mm-hmm. God's hatred toward Esau was the proper response of a holy God toward a wicked man uh, who was wicked from conception being conceived and born in sin, the incredible thing, incredible good news is that God was gracious to his brother who had nothing else going beyond what Esau had. God simply chose to save him. Um, And and for many, that's a very hard thing. And and if we're not careful, we can turn that into a matter of pride without any logical basis. (laughs) Yeah, well, I'm saved. I'm one of the elect. How about you? (laughs) Okay, you understand that that means you did nothing. Again, the the, the meme that that Emily posted on our our website or the uh, Facebook page, which I love so much. So let me get this right. In this plan, I do nothing. That's right. Let's do this thing. We, we, We have to get to that point where we understand that faith is a gift of God, a sovereign gift uh, that we receive in the same way that a teacup receives the tea that's poured into it. 
Uh, it is not an active, it's not an action whereby God says, here's his faith, do you want it? And we reach out on our own initiative and either take it or slap it out of his hand. <laughs> We're not was, Chip and Mrs. Potts. <laughs> we yeah, can't that decide would, to be filled with tea. <laughs> yeah, that, that would still put us back in the driver's seat. If we get to control salvation, we get to control grace, we get to control the plan of God, we get to control our eternal destiny. And that's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is we're dead. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to be saved, you know, corpses don't go get up and start affecting their, their resurrection. That's called zombies and that's scary. <laughs> we, we tell nightmare stories about zombie apocalypses because it's scary. We don't want dead people walking around doing stuff. And the Bible does not allow for it either. Life is in God and God as life comes to us and breathes life into us in his spirit so as to quicken us to a living faith. Now, having said that, and the, the um, listener's other question is, well, is it, is it something we do? Or Yeah, it's something we do, we believe. God doesn't believe for us. Mm -hmm. But it's the function of someone who is spiritually alive, and the life comes from God, mm -hmm. not from us. And God, in quickening us by the gospel and tying us to Christ, regenerates us, gives us a new heart that loves God, trusts God, lays hold on Jesus, and will be content with nothing but Jesus. And that's the nature of the thing. Is is it an action? Well, in the sense that it's a, a, an activity of our psyche, mm -hmm. of our mind, will, and emotions, yes. But is it in any sense meritorious? Does it accomplish something? And, it, and above all, at this point, is it self-generated? No, it's not self-generated. If faith is not a work and it's not meritorious, then how in the world does it save us? Well, in a sense, it doesn't. <laughs> faith is not our Savior. God is our Savior. Yes. He saves us by grace through faith. Faith is instrumental. Our Savior is Jesus. Faith is the means whereby God quickens us to lay hold on Christ, and he does it for Jesus' sake. You know, he does it because Jesus bought on the cross the gift of faith for us. And on the basis of what Jesus did, of what he purchased, of that whole total salvation, which includes our regeneration, the gospel brings this faith to us. God brings it to us through the gospel, through faith, through the work of the Spirit. So we lay hold on Christ as he lays hold on us. And by being legally and spiritually uh, united with Christ, covenantally in a word, we, we find ourselves in Christ and therefore justified. His righteousness becomes ours. And tied to Christ existentially in that now he lives in us and works in us by his spirit so that his, we are justified, his righteousness being ours, our sins being punished in him. And moreover, he's now the source of our life and the source of, of our actions, of who we are and what we do. And then that brings us to the doctrine of sanctification, which is where we need to go eventually because that's another dimension to all of this. But I, th I think we've addressed most of, of, of the high points concerning faith. Oh, well, maybe we should actually give a definition of faith at this point. The Heidelberg Catechism's faith, uh, definition of faith is real simple. Faith is not only a certain knowledge whereby I hold for truth all that God has revealed to me in his word, but also a hearty trust that the Holy Spirit works in me by the gospel, then not only to others, but to me also. Uh, salvation, forgiveness, everlasting righteousness, are freely given to me of God, not of works, only for the sake of Christ's merit. But up front, the two things, and Brian addressed one of them, we've been hitting all around the other, that it involves a absolutely certain knowledge. We know these things to be true. We, we trust Jesus. We know who he is. We know really true things, real and true things about Jesus. So there's a knowledge there. It's not just a feeling along or a vague sensibility that there's someone out there that this Jesus we can talk about. But having this knowledge, we then trust him for our salvation. And it has nothing to do with our works or with our faith. Faith I also, is not... Go ahead. I'm just going to add a little bit of flavor text to that, I, I guess. I don't know if that's what you'd really call this, but the knowledge that accompanies faith, that informs us of the subject of our faith, is also something that is correspondent to your level of understanding in general. Mm -hmm. I, I remember at one point having a discussion about saving faith and whether or not the mentally infirm right. could have faith. 
And the fact is that, yes, they can. It may not express itself in a knowledge like ours because of that mental infirmity. But it's still there. They still trust in Jesus. They know that Jesus cares for them, and he's died for them, and he loves them. They may not know the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. Yeah. But they know that that Christ loves them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not as though any of us has a perfect mind. We have not been glorified (laughs) yet. Like, this is all degrees and types Mm -hmm. of knowledge. Yeah, we're not saved by the quality of our knowledge. I really appreciate that point, Brian. I I don't Mm -hmm. think I would have made it if you hadn't brought it up. So thank you very much. Uh, Because in that way, we can make our theological knowledge a work. Yeah. Well, Mm -hmm. you don't know this doctrine yet, so your faith can't be real. But when you know (laughs) as much stuff as I do, and again, it becomes a matter of intellectual and spiritual pride. Mm -hmm. Knowing stuff rather than knowing knowing Jesus. Knowing stuff rather than knowing Jesus. Yeah. And... um, and I think it's a real temptation in reform circles. I've I've seen at least within those I travel in, especially among young teenage guys <clears throat> um, <laughs> who, who love winning theological battles or thinking they won theological battles. But mm-hmm. Put a little notch well, you, in the bell. You know that if you shout by what standard enough times that they give up, <laughs> that you won. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Automatic win. Automatic yeah. win. But I, I have known, I, I've been blessed to know a lot of, Godly Christians who are not members of Reformed churches and their theology, in many cases, at, at some points, has come out as being, yeah, that's not right. <laughs> uh, but you know what? They know Jesus. They they know him to the level of, the, of how they've been instructed, of how much they've been taught, of what they've read, of whom they've trusted to learn things from. And they, according to the light they've been given, the information they've been given, they're trusting Jesus. And if they knew that they had anything wrong, they would change. They may, they may not be in a position to understand that, but because we are all sinners and that sin gets in the way and ignorance gets in the way, mm-hmm. uh, which are not the same thing in and of themselves, mm-hmm. but they are indeed people who love Jesus. And often in um, how what they do with that faith that is not as well as informed in mine puts me to shame. Mm-hmm. Yeah, They pray more. They witness more. They're willing to take persecution more directly for Jesus. They step up to the plate and stand for Jesus, even though their faith may not be what is informed as we would like it to be. And, and human- Reformed churches are not exempt from this. Like some uh, of the errors no, that we've been talking about today yeah, are to very prominent in particular Reformed circles. Yeah, and, and even there, we do need a certain amount of graciousness because mm-hmm. there are people who are not really good theologians and their pastors, and their teachers come along and tell them these things that are contrary to the gospel, but couch it in beautiful words and words that mm-hmm. seem backed up with scripture. And what they hear is gospel, gospel, gospel. And they don't realize they're being lied to. They don't mm-hmm. realize that reality is, is twisting and distorting. Their, their, their thinking is simple or they haven't given the diligence they ought to. Or haven't had and, time. They haven't had time because they, they might be lies. young. And, in the faith. Yeah, yeah. And so we can't simply, or we shouldn't simply sit back and say, well, you belong to a group of people who've rejected the gospel. Obviously, you're all going to hell. We don't know that. Right. But it's probably not true. So we need to be very careful about those things. And yet we can say, look, here's the gospel. Here are things that are contrary to the gospel. For your own sake, you should move away from those things that are contrary. And you should embrace the gospel as scripture reveals it. And if you seem someplace in a wasteland between the two, I'm turning, I'm letting God judge you because I've walked through wastelands too. Mm-hmm. And there have been times when my life has not been right with God. So uh, you're, 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 you're searching after God and you're trying to submit to the Bible and you think you, what you believe is in the Bible. Okay. But then there are those teachers who have every reason to know better. They know what mm-hmm. they're rebelling against. They know when they're being sneaky, deceptive. Mm-hmm. Uh, God holds them to a tighter standard. Mm-hmm. And we must we must also for the sake of the flock, for the sake of God's people. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, we don't teachers don't get to say I'm the one in authority, so you don't you, you don't get to criticize me when I'm wrong. Yeah, it is yeah. in fact more the opposite. <laughs> yeah, we need to hold our teachers accountable, mm-hmm. and we need to be as teachers. We need to be held accountable when so, yes. someone comes to us and says. There was something you said I don't think was right. We 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 ought to say, oh, okay. Well, start at the beginning. And tell me what it was. I want to I want I want to know what you're saying here. 
not how dare you, you Cretan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you Put down the I'm, defenses. <laughs> you know, just yeah. listen because they might just be right. And mm-hmm. if well, that's they that's aren't, the reason why one of the qualifications for elder is not quarrelsome. Yeah, not quarrelsome. Yeah. Yeah, the servant of God must be gentle, must not strive. This is basic. And someone who comes across constantly with an arrogant attitude of, I'm right, you can't criticize me. Or you can try, but I'll shoot you down and make mincemeat out of you. That's that's not what God would have of his teachers, of his pastors and his servants. Mm-hmm. But circling back, Brian, to the, to the point that you specifically that you made, the mint, what we used to call the mentally infirm, I don't know what the political correct words are anymore. <clears throat> in my generation, we would often speak of those who were mentally retarded. I know that's not the word we use anymore. Today, we might say somewhere on the spectrum, that's going to be politically incorrect within a few years, I'm pretty sure. Mm-hmm. But we, we, their, their minds don't work quite the way most people's do. And, and this provides some degree of not being able to understand things very well, at least not being able to communicate. And there are people who are afraid that, well, if if faith requires some kind of knowledge, then these people are lost forever. There's nothing we can do. No, no. God can save children in the womb. Uh, the Holy Spirit normally works through the external means of preaching, the preaching of the word and the understanding of specific content. But he's sovereign. And that's just a means that God's pick and God could pick other means and sometimes does. He can reach a child in the womb. He can reach somebody who suits us might at our current level of knowledge seem nearly brain dead or at least comatose or out of how many how many stories have we heard of people who we we, we thought were lost and one day they open their eyes and, and the machines are taken off and they actually remember hearing things or they remember songs or voices we don't know how god works and so we can trust a sovereign god to break through all of our limitations even ones that medical science thinks are impenetrable and reach the lost or reach its covenant people, reach the elect. So that's a good thing to remember. It keeps balancing us out so we don't get all full of ourselves. I even remember having a, a discussion where it, it was a hypothetical question of whether or not s- somebody in a hidden tribe in South America could still be saved by God because the, you know the gospel has never come there. It's never been missioned. Is that the, the verb form of that? I don't know. <laughs> evangelized. Like, evangelized, yes. Uh, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, the normative means, the way that we've been commanded to go out is to bring the gospel to people who have not heard it. But at the same time, if God wants someone saved, th- there's not necessarily anything that tells us, nope, sorry, you didn't get there in time. Uh, God's powerless to do anything. It's like, that's never an excuse to be like, well, let's not go out anywhere because God can do it anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and what the, the grounds you're treading on, and let's, let's anyone misunderstand, we're not following the C.S. Lewis, well, you believe in God as best you can and God's going to count that. <laughs> that kind of natural theology. However... <laughs> as seen in The Last Battle. <laughs> uh, and also, uh, Till We Have Faces. Mm-hmm. No, salvation is in Christ. Having said that, that does open up the question about How about all the children in the world who die in infancy and literally have had no opportunity to hear the gospel? My answer to that is, I don't know. My second answer is, but God knows and God is incredibly gracious. And I'm going to leave it at that. There's enough in scripture. You know, there's this, what what was the number of of people in Nineveh that God quoted? Oh, So so many thousand who don't know their right hand from their left. A lot. And also much cattle. And also (laughs) much cattle. God is good toward his creation. He delights in salvation. Can God save the children, the, 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 say all the children who have been aborted in this world? Could he save them? He can. He could. Some Christians are convinced he does, and I'm not convinced he doesn't. And it's, but if they are saved, and this should think, if they are saved, they're saved. That is, they're saved from sin. They're not innocents who would go to heaven because they've never mm-hmm. sinned. They are souls that Jesus would have saved because his salvation is that powerful. They would be saved in and through Christ. But the, the even the Westminster Confession kind of skirts the issue by saying, elect children dying in infancy. And some people have read that, and oh, we know what that means. No, you don't. 
It just means that there may be elect children who die in infancy. It doesn't say which ones, where. Are mm -hmm. they only the children of, of covenant families? Does it go beyond that? The confession marvelously simply leaves God to be God mm -hmm. and says that the salvation that is in Christ can reach through means that we don't know. On, on the other hand, that does not mean we should go around aborting children or slaughtering infants because that will send them directly to heaven because God's got that covered somehow. Nor does it mean, we should, as you say, that we should leave tribes unevangel unevangelized or New York or Berkeley um, unevangelized <laughs> because somehow if they never hear, well, God will save them. No, we, we're told how God normally works and it's most of the time. But the, the thing we will continue to insist on, it is through Jesus. Mm -hmm. Not through natural revelation, not through human goodness, not through anything we have done or can do, but it is through Jesus. And so that's the gospel we preach, a gospel that points to Jesus and that God has ple is pleased to use overwhelmingly most of the time to call his elect to himself. And it's our job to be as clear as we can, given our own limitations. I think I've mentioned before that, um, I'm, I'm particularly I'm thinking of one older couple in our church that I talked to and they they confessed honestly and humbly that we're, we're kind of afraid to do evangelism because we're afraid we're going to sound like Arminians. Um, go ahead and sound like Arminians then. I mean, uh, you're, you, you're, you've been Christians how long? <laughs> where, where have we failed that something like this comes up? The Apostle Philip. We, he says to Nathaniel, mm -hmm. we found him of whom Moses and the law of prophets had right. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of the son Joseph. Joseph. <laughs> he got it all wrong. <laughs> and yet, when Nathaniel's, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I mean, he picks up on that. Mm -hmm. And Philip finally comes, come and see. We can all at least do that. Come and see. Come and hear. Mm -hmm. Let we me can show all you invite Jesus. someone. There, we there can invite is, someone. The gospel is freely offered to all. Yeah. yeah. And we absolutely insist on that. And, and it's it's also important to understand what the gospel is when you're yeah. actually telling it to them, because the gospel is not believe. No, that is that should be the response to the gospel. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the response that only the Spirit can give to you. Yeah. But the gospel itself is Jesus Christ came to die for sinners, mm -hmm. and if you and that's believe in what him, you believe, yeah. And if you believe yeah. in him, the consequence is. You will be saved. Christ died for sin according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scripture. That's it. <laughs> you can say that. Presumably, they'll have questions. I mean, Paul's what must invitation. we do? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Men and brethren, what shall we do? Since well, you're the ones that got him crucified. <laughs> that, it did, that Whether it was literally really you question. crucifying him or your own sin. Yeah or your covenant leaders, as the case may be. Yeah. So, um, Shall yes. we come back and focus a little bit more on this last question? We've yes. kind of touched on it, but I think it needs some more direct response. Can, can you read this, it again? Are there things that we can choose by the Holy Spirit's work within us to do to strengthen our faith? Or is that something that the Holy Spirit does regardless of our choices and how we choose to live? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that's what I was going to say. Uh, sanctification is monergistic, but mm -hmm. it's the Holy Spirit leading us into things that are going to grow us. Things that he has promised to use. And I, again, Brian, I really appreciate, appreciate the word monergistic there, for mm -hmm. those of you who may not know it from two Latin words, mono, or actually the Greek, I guess, Greek, mono, yeah. which is only or alone, and the word for energy, or it's, it's one one yeah. one energy, one work, one. Yeah. It, it, it's comes from God. It's God's sovereign work in us, and it's not synergistic. It's not working yes. together. It's God's work. And unfortunately, there are points where reform, really good, honorable, well-meaning reform theologians, haven't been clear about that. Mm -hmm. You ask them, "What is, is sanctification God's work or ours?" And you get what is essentially a synergistic answer. Because they, they're confusing what the Holy Spirit does with what the Holy Spirit moves and leads us to do mm -hmm. to promote the process. We don't make ourselves holy. That's the work of the Spirit of God. God the, Through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. 
And it, it feels in the moment, though, like we're deciding to do things, right? Because like no. we make real choices. We do decide, yeah, I'm going to open my Bible and read it instead of scrolling no. through Facebook. That's well, a choice that we make in our real lives. One of but my favorite chapters to reference out of the Westminster is chapter nine of free will, where it mm -hmm. talks about how mankind does have a, a will that is free to make choices, but it is yeah. free to make choices in that are consistent with its nature. Yeah. So yeah. in the case of a Christian, this, the will is set free by the Holy Spirit to choose these things. In other words, the heart has been transformed so that the will springs from a good heart yes. and will now choose the right things. And the Holy Spirit is at work in the heart, continuing to cleanse and to grow and to strengthen and to impart life. Mm -hmm. And the result of that is that we make better choices than we were making. It is God who is at work within you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And yet we're, we are willing and we are doing, but it's God who's working at the bottom of all this in our hearts so that we are now the kind of people who make those choices. And yes, there are some certain things that God has promised to bless. Uh, most obviously the preaching of the word. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You want to strengthen your faith? Go hear the gospel some more. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about prayer. God, hold God will, Jesus said that God will most certainly give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Mm -hmm. And then we can talk about the sacraments. We can talk about Christian fellowship and other things that, that spin around hearing God's promises, understanding them and laying hold on them in Christ. And these are real things that we can do, should do, will do. But the other side of, of Brian's answer, and if we don't, God has ways. <laughs> Um, some Making you back to the Lord to <laughs> who loves his son, will he not chasten him? Will he not chasten? Mm -hmm. Even the father is a son he delighteth in. It's not God's wrath against us that's satisfied in Christ, but it's his fatherly displeasure, but the, the displeasure of a father who loves us and wants what's best for us and will bring the rod to bear on our behinds when the normal processes get interrupted, as sometimes they do, when we, we refuse, sin gets stubborn and we refuse to relinquish an idol. God will do other things. He will use external means that will resound in our hearts, as well as the internal promptings of his word by his spirit. Yeah, so, we're, po post conversion, we, we preach contra Edwards, uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Mm -hmm. God does not look upon us loathingly. Yes, as a as a spider held over the flames. No, he looks at us and he sees Jesus, mm -hmm. and he wants us to be conformed to that more and more. And he uses everything in our lives; all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. And so, predestination and this whole golden chain of salvation is not just so that we can escape hell or go to heaven when we die, it's so that we can be like Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's God's agenda. That's what's that. That's where this is going. And he's not going to let it falter. He's going to keep pushing within and without using everything in our lives uh, to get us there. And it's, it's a long road in most cases. Sometimes God speeds up the plan and calls someone home early, and, and death provides the final nudge into entire sanctification. For most of us, God takes his time, and it's his artwork, and it's a process. We are his poem, his workmanship, Paul mm -hmm. says, created in Christ Jesus on two good works, which God has before our day that we should walk in them. God has decreed the works. Now we have to find them and walk in them, and we do that by faith, and that's where that faith is the gift of God comes from, that same, that same context. There is something else I would like to talk about, but I'm looking at the clock and thinking that maybe we need one more episode. Because whereas we, we can think of Federal Vision, a new perspective on Paul and things in Roman Catholicism and Arminianism, who who try to make faith work, I, I'm seeing another movement within the church that says, basically, yeah, you believe in Jesus, you have done well, that's all there is. Mm -hmm. Don't mm -hmm. even talk about works. If you even bring up works, you're probably deluding the gospel. There's one writer who, in many respects, I, I do respect because he's addressed federal vision, some of these other things, very tellingly. But when he kind of turns around and starts writing about faith, he starts saying things like, well, you don't, don't attempt great things for God. You have nothing to attempt for God. Hmm. Don't go out and try to be a hero for God. 
You can't do that. There's nothing. You can simply trust Jesus and that's it. Yeah, God may do something here or there, but don't, don't, don't try, don't try hmm. to do anything or you derail the gospel. And so if you don't mind, I would like at some point, doesn't have to be right away, to come back and look as we originally planned. At Hebrews 11. Oh, yes. Hey. <laughs> that was like and the first point on our outline for tonight. Yeah. And we got, well, I mean, we got even, even that guy you're talking about, I don't know who it is, but I mean, the thing you're describing is correct if you limit it. Yeah, yes, in a, in exactly. a limited it's, sense. You do yeah. not, it's, it's not the call of every Christian in order to be justified uh, or found worthy of heaven to go out and sell everything they own, to go to Uzbekistan, to go no. to deepest, darkest Sahara. Um, darkest Peru. Darkest Peru. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, there, there, yeah. there is faithfulness there, there is, in your yeah. own area. Yeah. yeah. And, and, anyway. and yes, we, we need to be clear about that. But at the same time, we need not discourage people. Oh, absolutely. From trusting God for something that is not required, but that might be really cool. Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, we have so many evidences of God actually coming and saying, go do this. It's weird. It's strange. and No one will understand you to do it. And people responded. But today, where God does not generally give us that kind of verbal invitation, mm -hmm. Emily, I want you to start a podcast. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's not what happened. <laughs> I did get my husband saying to me, I think we should start a podcast. <laughs> so you know, I, you I remember one of my favorite memes this year has been like, just a reminder, the CDC is reminding you that even after you are vaccinated, you should not start a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good thing we started this before COVID. Yeah, yeah that's how it works. So there, there, there is still more to say for faith. And since the mm -hmm. writer of Hebrews takes an entire chapter, mm -hmm. I, I think it would be worthwhile. And also in, in, in reference to the, well, where does justification in the, in, by faith appear in the Bible but in Romans? Well, in the book said <laughs> Hebrews 11. Yeah. Because the writer makes it very clear that although he's talking about things that people did at every point, He's assuming justification by faith, the righteousness, which is by faith. That's the common thread. Mm -hmm. So I, I think if we can go back and do that at some point, that, that'd be great. All right. We'll do that. So shall we wrap up with some recommendations? I can go first. If okay. Yeah, you go please first. do. Um, so I actually have three things to recommend. One of them I alluded earlier, so it's kind of half of a recommendation. <laughs> that is um, Akira the Dawn and his really excellent, I guess you'd call them remixes of like Jordan Peterson speeches and, and talks and audio clips and stuff into electronic music. Uh, specifically his album, 12 Rules for Life, which is about the speech that Jordan Peterson gave talking about his book, 12 Rules for Life, and it's very good and uh, relevant a bit to what we are talking about, especially not lying because lying <laughs> warps the essence of being or the structure of being. Uh, the second thing to recommend is a book I just finished this week for the first time. Somehow I'd taken forever to even get started on it. And that is the gospel comes with a house key by Rosaria Butterfield, mm. okay. which is phenomenal. Speaking um, of the gospel and gospel faith being lived out in actions. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it's very good. Uh, she's a, RPCNA minister's mm -hmm. wife. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I I love the stories in it too. I, I cried at a couple different points because it was very touching. Like uh, the story of about her and her mom when uh, her mom was dying. Yeah, they got the tears going a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> then the third thing, which is uh, very relevant to what we're talking about tonight and which I believe I've recommended before, but it's such a evergreen recommendation i'm going to do it again and that is sinclair ferguson's the whole christ where he mm. talks about the marrow controversy in the church of scotland in the 19th 18th or 19th century i forget which and the differences and similarities between legalism and antinomianism how they sort of mm. horseshoe back around to very yes. similar 
yeah. outworkings. Um, and then the solution to that, which is the proper distinction between law and gospel, which is everything we were talking about tonight, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So those are my Excellent. three. Excellent. Yes. Emily? Okay. Um, my recommendation is not really super relevant to this <laughs> conversation, but it was really great. So last week, y'all had your, well, Brian wasn't there either. But <laughs> Greg and David and David and David had this lovely conversation about science and wonder and uh, the gospel in that arena of life. Um, meanwhile, I was listening to the entire run of the new podcast of Hank the Cowdog, <laughs> which stars Matthew McConaughey as Hank the Cowdog. And oh boy, all it's right, incredible. All right, all right. That's the guy. Um, so the Hank the Cowdog is a series of children's books um, that entertained my family for hours and hours and hours on road trips. The original audiobooks are read by the author and he does like all the different voices and the original <laughs> songs and instrumentation and all that. So I was really skeptical when my dad was like, hey, you know, there's a new Hank the Cowdog podcast. And I was like, <laughs> not so sure about this business. And then he's like, it's Matthew McConaughey. And I'm like, I'm... Still not sure about this business, but I'm slightly less unsure. And I listened to the entire thing last week in oh, wow. the course of a couple of hours because it was phenomenal. Uh, did not disappoint. There's only like five episodes right now. I hope there will be more soon, but highly recommend that. Very entertaining, even as an adult. Fantastic. All right. Well, I'm going to wax all theological and recommend um, two things. The um, uh, Christian Reformed Bible curriculum called Promise and Deliverance. Uh, you, you find it online, and it's probably going to be expensive, especially in hardback, although I think they're, re they're reprinting it in paperback. Mm -hmm. The thing that is so wonderful about it is it, come, it it's, it's, takes a biblical theological approach to the Old and New Testament, which is to say, it does not come to the Bible stories and look for, mm -hmm. here's the lesson, children. Mm -hmm. Rather, it shows the wise teacher how to see Christ mm -hmm. in each of the mm. stories. So that teaching Sunday school stops being a legalistic, well, here's the moral of the story, to here's how we should see Jesus here. Mm -hmm. So that that's wonderful. promise and deliverance. I won't, I won't stand for this attack on Veggie Tales. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. the other is an old Puritan work by Thomas Boston. It's called Human Nature in Its Fourfold State. It's Puritan, so it comes with all of that. Paragraph so, length, chapter headings. Yeah, <laughs> and, and subheadings and sub subheadings and all of that, and lots of references to scripture. Point firstly, point secondly, and all that. Have, however, having said that, you want a solid introduction to what the Bible says about man. It's the image of God as he was created to man fallen in a rebellion against God and to the regenerate man in Christ. You're not going to, you're not going to do much better than this. Uh, reading it may not be the literary experience of your life, but in terms of just finding good theological content and verses you can look up, it's wonderful. The fourth estate is man in glory when the regenerate man is finally freed from sin. And, I, uh, I'm reasonably certain the set of terms are older than Boston, but is is that where he draws out like the the, the four Latin phrases like "posse non picare," "non posse non picare"? Like, you know, it's been so long since I've read it, I cannot swear to it, but that sounds awfully familiar. Yeah, it yeah. does. It's my favorite set of Latin phrases. I think, besides, <laughs> you know, the soli. Not not Wingardium Leviosa. <laughs> Uh, that that's no. No. <laughs> okay. I didn't that, take Latin. For <laughs> well, actually, that my favorite Latin phrase is, of course, "Carthago delenda est." Yeah. Well, no, obviously, yes. isn't that everybody's? <laughs> Naturally. Cave canum. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much. This has been fun. We have run long, but it's been a good time. Uh, thank you so much, listeners, for listening. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Hope you enjoyed his not-quite-cameo appearance last week. His <laughs> significantly more significant than cameo appearance. Yeah, go back and listen to that if you haven't yet. And we're going to do it again. Yes. Oh. 
it yeah much like this episode (laughs) need to need to make another one of these things happen so look forward to that um again we are on break releasing bi-weekly until july we'll be back in july with weekly episodes so this is a great time to send us emails rate us on our facebook page leave a review on whatever podcast catcher you're listening on and tell a friend about us see you next week or rather now i've just messed it up for you <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how it sounded like you were doing well, but I will let you up. David edit this too. (laughs) (laughs) David has so much work to do today. (laughs) Did you want to pick it up from there? Um, No, we'll just cut it before I blue screened. I'm sorry, guys. I'm not with it. That's (laughs) okay. I used to be with it. Then they changed what it was. (laughs) Now what I'm with isn't it. And it'll happen to you. (laughs) Oh, and now I think this brings us to yet another issue connected with all this.